Oh, uh, thanks you all for uh, braving the winter weather for coming out today. Um, I, uh, I do want to give you all just a quick heads up. Um, if you all are uh, thinking about traveling um, for the holidays, uh, the Thanksgiving holiday particularly, it's next week. I can hardly believe it. Um, so uh, I will be here, and I will do my lecture as normally scheduled, uh, and I will post it. So if you're gone, you can watch it on video. No big deal. Um, but it would be great if like at least five people came, because you know it might make me feel bad. Um, so <laughs> that's my, my plea to you. Um, but yeah, obviously, uh, a lot of people are traveling, so that's expected. Um, so today, we're going to uh, kind of jump into Rhino, if I just turn off um, our kind of background music here. Um, in Rhino, we're sort of uh, well in hand um, sort of making this model, and we made some significant strides last week. Um, today, we're going to be focusing on primarily on materials, and if we have time, we'll get into rendering. Um, if we don't have time, which I anticipate that we probably won't, um, this sort of like wild card day on Thursday is basically going to be our time to kind of finish up some of the specifics of rendering. So that rendering stuff is necessary uh, for you to see and know about in order to complete the reality on reality assignment. So just kind of a heads up for that. Um, so let's go back to our model. Um, I did give myself uh, a little bit of a, I'm going to turn the mic down just a tiny bit. Um, I did give myself like a little bit of a to-do list today. Um, I also made what um, in the industry is called a change log. Um, so I basically, uh, I did some things while I was off camera to the model, and I just wanted to kind of go over those with you so you knew what I, what I had done. Um, they're really small changes. Um, that's why I felt like I could do them, and they're all changes that are like well within the boundaries of what we've done like 100 times, like moving things, rotating things. Um, so I rescaled the room uh, to just give, give me a little bit more, no pun intended, room to maneuver. Um, I twisted the big lamp with holes, um, which is using that twist function that I covered last week. Um, and I scaled it up a tiny bit. That should be up. Um, I also scaled up the boat. Um, and then I moved the lights to their own layer. Um, so as you recall, at the end of class uh, last time, we uh, created these two light objects, these two spotlights. Um, and then, to be honest, I'm not really sure if I did um, move the uh, little point lights that are inside of the, the twisty thing. So um, probably the best way for me to um, take care of that would be to... Also trying to find an optimal position here. Um, a go into the uh, edit menu and you can just select lights. So that'll select every light in the scene, including these three inside of this. So I'm just gonna double check that all of the lights are actually on uh, one layer. So I'm gonna change them to this layer that I created called lights. Um, also, I just did this like two seconds ago. Um, I made an extra lamp. Um, so I took this spinny lamp and I just, um, this is really complex. I cut and pasted and I moved it um, and then I rotated it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so um, that's basically what happens is it just kind of makes the lighting a little bit more dense and kind of complex. Um, so we'll bring that in probably at the end, um, that sort of extra lamp. I was feeling like things were looking, we do have the cone of the spotlight sort of creating you know, the emphasis on the boat. Um, but I wanted there to be a little bit more contrast. Um, so I just decided that one is good, two is better. So thinking forward, we're really going to kind of concentrate on materials. And so materials are basically like probably not a bad way of thinking about it. Um, it's not maybe like a super correct way, but I think it makes sense is to think of materials as like clothes. So um, what do I mean by that? Well, we all know what a naked body looks like. You know, it's got skin. That's kind of the default material, right? Um, if I put this shirt on, it has all sorts of other characteristics that can come along with it. But it's still pretty much confined to like the form of my body, right? Or the form of the original shape. Um, and so really, that's kind of what we're thinking about when we think about materials. They're sort of like 
um, like dressing or like special sauce or fabric. Um, but of course, they're none of those things. Um, now, when we do look for materials, um, I mean, this is, relatively speaking, a fairly uh, sort of simple scene. We've got probably like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten or eleven objects. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, like the environment that I'm working on right now probably has like between three and three and four hundred objects. Um, so one of the things that I know I've been talking to you all about a lot lately is like the idea of grouping and layering and that kind of thing. Um, especially when you start to get into materials, that stuff also becomes important because, you know, you might want to select certain objects like all at once and give them all the same material, right? So just that type of sort of organizational planning can become a little bit, um, a little bit important when you're working with materials. So primarily when we work with materials, we're using uh, JPEGs. And the reason for that is a couple of reasons. Um, J JPEGs are compressed, um, as we sort of discussed back when we were looking at Photoshop. Um, and so JPEGs tend to be a format that performs pretty well as far as speed. You can also use TIFFs. You can also use PNGs. Um, for my money, I would use a JPEG or a PNG. Um, if you use a TIFF, it's sort of like um, sort of like making your own mayonnaise. Like nobody does that, and it just takes longer. <laughs> There's no real reason why you would want to do that. If unless you like really, really love mayonnaise, you know, and you want to like taste the delicate dance of the vinegar and the egg, um, you know, then maybe you would want to use like a really high quality. Um, image, but the reason why maybe there's not this, uh, this emphasis on high quality images with materials in particular is because, let's say hypothetically we want to, well, it's really not hypothetical, let's say we want to texture this boat. Um, probably we may have a material that's about this big and we're going to be repeating it 50 to 100, maybe even 1,000 times. So taking that one image and you know, knowing that you're going to repeat it, it's a little bit of a different sort of uh, way of thinking about it. You want an image that's relatively kind of lightweight and, and will you know, quickly render. So, so my sort of general rule for materials, and you can kind of take this to the bank, um, is that I like to search for materials that are no greater than 1,000 pixels in any dimension. Um, if you have materials that are a lot larger, um, it's just going to kind of bog you down. Um, now, if you're one of those people that is maybe working in Unity and using the high def rendering pipeline and you're really super into it, by all means, use all the crazy materials you can find. <laughs> um, but if you know, you're using your uh, Rhino on your MacBook Pro or your MacBook Air even and you're looking for a sort of like something to kind of get you through the assignment, I would definitely stick to my 1,000 pixel uh, recommendation. So I have this idea that for this boat, I'm thinking like the kind of sort of like derelict boat that maybe you would like pull out of some garage, like an abandoned garage in a ghost town or something. So I'm going to go ahead and go out to Google. Um, I do have a lot of textures um, saved up. Um, Oops, not that. Um, from previous semesters, so I'm just going to show you what my texture bank looks like. Um, so these are all the textures that I have um, in here. Um, but none of these textures are really screaming boat to me. Um, I have this uh, sort of wood grain. This might be good for a small wooden object. Um, also, probably excellent for a small wooden object. Also, excellent for a small wooden object where you don't have like multiple boards and that kind of a thing. But for the boat, um, we're really potentially looking for something a little bit different where we can actually see the slats of wood. Um, so this is actually the floor texture that I'm probably going to use. And um, I found it through the same means that I'm going to show you right at the second. So, oh, good. Sorry, I just looked at the thing and I thought it wasn't recording. <sighs> okay, so um, basically what I'm going to look for on Google is something like uh, weathered wood slats uh, texture tile. 
Now, there's a couple of important things here. Um, if, you, if you shop for, or if you Google for, weathered wood texture, you're probably going to find a lot of things that have text, the visual quality of texture in them, but they're not created to be 3D repeatable textures, right? So it's very important that when you search for stuff that you make that distinction because there are some very clear differences. So the way that I kind of get around that is by either um, searching for the word seamless or searching for the word tile um, on my Google search. Um, so it just kind of like focuses the search a tiny bit more and tends to give me like a little bit better results. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the images part. And I'm just going to kind of scroll through here, and I'm going to just evaluate. Now, OK, so these are all actually pretty good. Um, so probably I would not want to click on any of these uh, Pinterest links because it's kind of hard to get to the original content. Um, this one looks really promising. It's from the SketchUp Texture Club. So. If you know that it's from like a 3D texture website, it's probably designed to be repeatable. Um, so that's, I would gravitate towards that. Um, so some really well-known 3D asset sites are like TurboSquid, um, of course the SketchUp, um, anything having to do with SketchUp. Um, probably some other ones, uh, CG Access, access um, textures.com. There's a bunch, there's like hundreds of them. But um, anyway, those are the ones that you probably want to look for the, the most. So I'm going to try this one and see what it's made of. So this is a 300 by 300 pixel texture. Um, that actually should be just fine um, because you can maybe kind of like imagine in your mind that this texture, if that is a nail head right there, this texture is going to be repeating itself quite a few times in order to cover a boat, right? So I'm going to go ahead and just grab this one. Um, so I'm just going to do the whole save image as thing. And I'll get it in here. So fabulous. And I think actually for this scene, this is probably the, one of the only uh, JPEG textures we'll be using. Um, so there are basically two options with materials for Rhino. One is that you can use the prefab materials that Rhino comes sort of like stocked with. Um, and the other is that you can make your own material um, by using a JPEG texture, adjusting a custom material parameters. Guess what? We're going to do both, <laughs> do both different kinds of things. So, OK, so in here, I'm going to come into this boat. And um, just before I start kind of messing around in here, I'm going to make sure that the room is locked. And it looks like the lights are also locked, um, just because I don't want to be kind of clicking around and accidentally selecting stuff. Um, if you all have known maybe one thing about me, it's that I'm a little bit of a spaz with the click in. So uh, if I click on this and then I go to the toothpaste tube over here, um, anytime you select an object in Rhino, you're going to get this properties objects menu. If you are not getting the properties objects menu on your sidebar here, don't worry. Uh, you can also click this button that looks like kind of like a beach ball. Um, and you can just click it, and it'll bring it up in a, a floating palette. It's the same thing. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the toothpaste. And you can see that right now it's set to the default material. So just to give you some context, every single object in my scene, except for the lights, is the default material. What are the lights? They don't, they don't get a material. <laughs> they don't, they're not capable of having a material. So um, I'm going to click this big uh, sort of arrow looking thing here. And if I go down to uh, custom, um, it looks like I already did this just before class. So I'm actually going to, the one thing I need to do is I'm going to change this color texture. And so if, um, if this weren't sort of set. Do, do, do. So I'm just looking for that texture that I just saved. Hmm. Uh, 
Um, hang on just one second. I have to go see where I put that. I could have sworn I put it in 107 recent. Is it in? Oh, oh, hey, thank you. <laughs> of course, I'm sitting here like staring at it like, what is wrong with me? <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, so basically you might sort of look at this initially and say, whoa, that it looks like crap. That's not exactly what I meant for it to look like. Don't worry. We're just going to click it and um, go to back to that um, texture that we have. And actually, in this case, it looks like I selected a bunch of other stuff. So we just want to select this. And so Indeed, it's a little messed up, and that's sort of typical. So when you bring a texture in um, with Rhino and you assign it to your object, Rhino doesn't really have like any frame of reference for what scale you want it to be or how you want it to look. So what you need to do is you need to click on this button right here. Sorry, this link sort of button. And this is where you can kind of get in and really change some stuff. And so if you scroll down here, you can adjust the number of times that the texture repeats. And so right now, it's set to only repeat once, which basically means that it's going to take the texture and it's going to like stretch it out over the entire form. In this case, not what we want at all, right? So let's just try putting in a different number here, like maybe 10. Um, I'll start there. And let's check it out and see if that gets us a little bit closer to what we're looking for. Um, unfortunately, in Rhino, you can't really deselect this and still um, sort of address the uh, material. So this is looking like a lot more sort of boat-like. Um, I think that's looking pretty respectable. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to sort of talk with you about. Let's go ahead and take this, um, this sort of middle object, which looks like it's grouped with the uh, sort of narwhal horn thingy. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just ungroup these objects and see. Hmm. Interesting. Closed poly surface. Uh, so, okay, I'm just going to explode these. Uh, at some point, I may have uh, asked for them to be the same. Um, and so now you can see I, have, I can basically select all of these surfaces. So when you're using materials in Rhino, um, just so you know, a material can apply to anything from a surface upward. So you can take a surface and that's just like a free-floating surface and assign a material to it. You can also assign poly surfaces, closed poly surfaces, solids. Um, and they will all accept uh, materials. Now, I'm going to give this a very similar um, material to the custom material that I just made. So I'm going to go ahead and make it in there. And notice that um, that material is sort of oriented in a certain way. So just as we discussed before, um, there is sort of a way to you know, control how it's tiling. There's also a way to kind of control the orientation of how it fits on the material. So I'm going to go ahead and just uh, select this again and uh, click the link for the actual file. And if we go in here, um, you can see you can actually uh, just rotate it. So you can rotate it 90 degrees. Um, and in this case, uh, I wanted to just kind of have an opportunity to show you how to do this, but just kind of from a design perspective, like, this is wrong. <laughs> um, wood almost always is, like, oriented on the long, the long way. Um, fun fact. Uh, yeah. So um, anyway, that's how you would rotate it. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just leave that uh, cancel out of there. And then I could also grab this surface and just go ahead and give it that little material there. Now, if I had like unlimited time um, sort of within this class environment, like I would actually, I'm just going to grab this one too. Um, I would actually maybe consider um, 
spending a little bit more time uh, on the boat uh, because there's something about the boat that's kind of irritating me a tiny bit. Um, and that is that this face right here, usually when boats are designed, they kind of go straight and they come up. So in order for us to do that, that's something that maybe we could do like on our Thanksgiving day as like, you know, fun things to do that we don't have time to do during normal class time. Um, basically, all we would have to do is just separate the, um, explode the surfaces, get them down to individual surfaces, and then assign those individual surfaces and, you know, give them a rotation value. Yes. 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 So in fact, there's one more texture that we need to do that comes from a JPEG, and that's the floor. So I'm going to go ahead and well, that's a good cue to sort of do the floor. So I'm going to unlock the room and select the floor. Uh, it looks like these might be grouped. So I'm going to quickly ungroup them. OK. So basically, this is sort of like starting over. I'm going to just go to the toothpaste -y thing in the Material tab, which you could also use this beach ball thing if you don't have it. And then if I go over to um, Default Material, by the way, just to clarify, if you select Custom and you give it a new file, it will affect all of the things that have that material. So actually, every time you create a new sort of JPEG or you want to use a new JPEG, you have to create a new custom material. So if we want to create a new custom material, we can just go to this little plus sign and go to custom. And basically, it's down here in sort of like a little bit down in the in the rotation here. So it's over here under color. And if you click the link, then it basically prompts you to find your file. So I think I have this like great floorboard texture here. Um, and guess what? It came in, in my opinion, a little bit large. Um, so I'm going to just click on this link and um, scroll down here, and I'm gonna maybe just reassign this repeat to like, I don't know, maybe like four or something. That looks pretty good where it's at right now. Um, and so this looks much more sort of like realistic, sort of a realistic scale for, uh, for a uh, sort of a floorboard. Um, because you know that when you have your fantasy imagery, like you have to have your floorboards look super realistic. Um, that's I'm being sarcastic. Um, so uh, yeah, so let's uh, kind of, are we cool to move on? Okay, so, so those were sort of two examples of like a JPEG material. And then there's another big sort of major type of material and that is the glorious prefab material that you may find um, in Rhino. So uh, before I go in and sort of select that stuff, I'm just going to turn off my, or rather lock, my room layer, because I think we're done with it. There's just one more texture I'd like to address in the room, and that is paint. Paint has a texture. Um, so I do have some paint texture. Um, but for right now, I'm really kind of thinking about this narwhal horn. So if I select the object, um, I can come in here and uh, I can create a new material. So I hit the plus button. And you'll notice that under, under, the, under custom, there are all of these other materials. Um, does Rhino have good materials? Um, yeah, they're pretty good, yeah. It's not like the greatest materials library in the whole world. Um, personally, I think Maya has the best materials, but um, for doing the kind of stuff that you would design in Rhino, I think it's pretty, pretty, pretty good. Um, so we're gonna go with a metal texture. And if you just go to the metal texture sort of thingy here, um, under type, you can see, oops, sorry. Uh, 
Um, you can basically uh, make it sort of any color you want. So if you go to the color, they have these sort of presets for what you might try. So I think we're gonna go with gold. And hit apply. Um, also, I think I would like to have a very polished texture. Um, I'm gonna try to, with this model, I'm gonna try to create a bunch of different types of textures so we can sort of see how they affect things, even like the light in the room. Um, a lot of the, some of the textures are gonna be reflective. Um, some of them are gonna be transparent. Um, all sorts of different ways that you can approach the idea of texture and materials. So here, I'm gonna go for a polished surface and um, for a bump texture, in this case, I want it to be perfectly smooth, so I actually don't want a bump texture. Um, a bump texture is basically just gonna give you kind of like a little sort of like, if you could imagine like maybe like the texture of like, you know, a freshly painted wall where it has that sort of subtle kind of bumpiness. Um, so in any case, um, the bump texture is gonna sort of fight against the, the polished qualities. So in this case, I wanna go for like super polished, like, you know, I just bought some cheap jewelry at like TJ Maxx or something, and it's like super glossy. So in any case, um, I think hopefully you can kind of see now what we're, what we're working with. And Although we can certainly start to kind of preview the materials um, in this rendered viewport, um, you're really not going to get a full preview of the materials until you render the scene, which is what we're gonna do hopefully later, uh, later today. I'll give you the sort of like quick and dirty instructions and maybe we'll get into the sort of full rendering instructions um, next week. So I also have this little thing hanging down here, so I'm gonna just grab that, and um, now my gold material is in my sort of materials list, so all I have to do is just assign it, and it's ready to go. Um, this, you may be pointing out to yourself um, that it doesn't look very shiny. Um, that's just because of the way that the light is falling on it, um, and you can see that it does actually have that shininess. So sometimes that can be a little bit distracting. So I've got a couple of other materials that I kind of want to work with. Um, one is I wanted to go ahead and give this a material because it may or may not be inside the scene. So um, it's pretty, pretty much kind of where we've been already. Just grab it, um, select it, go to this toothpaste-y thing, and then we're going to create a new material. Um, I think what would be probably fun here is to maybe give it a plastic material. Um, so the plastic materials tend to have kind of a waxy look, um, and you can set the settings um, over here. So I'm going to go for much more frosted. Um, and the main reason I'm going for kind of a frosted thing is because I do want some of the uh, that sort of, like, what will happen is if you have light and you're sort of shooting light through plastic, instead of shooting light through glass where it just passes through, the plastic will sort of like get a little glowy, like a little waxy looking. Um, and I'm also gonna just give it a little bit of a color. And so probably if I give this a color, that color may end up um, shooting through the, uh, the light. And it looks like Okay, so, so yeah, so there's our sort of object at this point. Now, the last thing that I wanted to do in terms of working with materials, um, there's just a couple of quick things. Um, one thing I wanted to do is I wanted to do something with these wings. Um, I think actually before I do something with the materials, I'm going to strip this back a little bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of my room um, just so I can sort of see this. And I'm gonna grab these wings and I'm going to do something which is uh, the function called uh, wireframe from object. So let's extract wireframe. 
So um, the reason why I'm going to extract the wireframe is for a very specific reason. Um, I would really like it if we could take these sort of curve objects that we just made, and if we could basically like make tubes along them, so that that way we can have sort of opaque tubes, like an opaque structure, and then transparent sort of like papery windows. Um, that sounds fun to me, and I think it's worth doing. So we haven't really talked about the tube function in Rhino, um, which is another reason why I wanted to do this. So the tube function is back here in the solid menu. And basically, if you take any curve of any kind, you can take that sort of you know, curve that you can't see in the rendering, and you can sort of render a pipe or a tube around it. And then it becomes an object that has mass. So in this case, I'm just going to come in here. And I'm going to use the pipe flat caps function. And it's asking me for a radius. So I'm just going to really quickly kind of zoom in here and double check. It seems like a radius of like maybe that 0.125 would probably be a good radius because I'm hoping that they end up being about a quarter inch. So 0.125 is half of that. And so there it is. So now you can see that I have these sort of um, tube-like things, right? And so basically at this point, I could um, select these guys. Um, I'm really particularly interested in the poly surfaces here. Um, I'm not so much interested in the, the curves. If I do happen to select the curves, that's probably just fine. Um, but I do want this last poly surface. Hmm. Interesting. So it actually looks like it didn't do the end, but that's fine. We can just go ahead and uh, roll with what we have. Um, I guess probably the reason that it didn't do the end is because when we made these, we were using the edge curves function. And I don't recall that we actually did have an end curve there. <laughs> so that would make sense. Um, OK, so in any case, I can go ahead and assign these a material. And then I'm going to assign a separate material to the sort of um, material, the stuff that's in between. So here, I think I'm going to use like, meh, Maybe I'll actually just use our, our wood material to kind of keep things easy and also maybe a little bit consistent. Um, looks like I might have the wrong objects selected here. So let me make kind of extra double sure here. OK, so this is the surface that we want. and. This blue one is also the surface that we want. So I'm just going to group these right now um, so I don't lose track of them. And then I'm just going to do the selection uh, one more time. OK, I definitely don't want that group. I want this poly surface. Um, so probably zooming in would help a little bit here. There we go. Um, and then I've got also this one piece, right, little piece right here. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and just group these. So hopefully I won't have that issue again. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and grab these. And I'm going to assign them a material. I'm going to make a fresh material for this. Um, probably, I think, if I wanted to look sort of papery, um, I could certainly make a custom material, but I'm actually just going to use the plastic material because we're sort, you know, sort of constantly pressed for time. Um, I'm going to turn the transparency up to like, like maybe 60. Um, the, when you get into sort of more subtle things like this, like transparency, um, I know it's kind of a bummer, but like, don't judge by what you have on, the, on this screen with the rendered viewport, um, particularly with transparency and reflections and things like that. 
you don't really get a good sense of what they're going to look like until you make a test rendering. So that's the next thing we're going to do. And technically, the next thing we're going to do is we have to texture the walls before we go there. So I do want to grab um, this sort of group of uh, pipes that we made. And uh, I'm just going to use sort of a generic metal material. Um, I'm not going to make them gold, I think. Although that does make a certain amount of sense, given that the narwhal horn is gold. Um, I think I'm going to make them look a little bit more like kind of like platinum, steel. Sure. That sounds good. Um, and I want them to be not super polished, like maybe somewhere in there. Um, OK, and so now you can kind of get a little bit of a better idea of you know, how that sort of you see how you can kind of see through them now. Ooh, pretty. Um, so <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty much how transparency works in Rhino. So um, I'm going to spin this back a little bit, and we're just going to put a texture on the wall. So bringing that room back, and really I just need to grab these two surfaces. And this would be another custom material um, because I could certainly use one of these from the list, but I'm just going to show you. I have this great paint texture that I absolutely love. I use it all the time. And it's right here. So this is just like a plaster wall with paint. Again, far too large. <laughs> so we're going to scale it down a little bit. Um, so I'm definitely going to scale this down quite a bit. So I'm going to go down to that, um, where it really it's probably like in the barely perceptible uh, range. Um, and let's go ahead and make a rendering. I'm ready. I've got a couple minutes left. Um, I'm going to just super quickly lock the room, and maybe I will bring in that extra lamp. Um, and at this point, I am so ready to make a, render a rendering. So there's a couple of things that um, you should know about rendering. Um, first of all, uh, there are render settings available to you if you go to render properties. Um, there are also uh, two renders, two renderers in Rhino. So what I usually do for students in this class is that I will do a render in each of the renderers and post them. Um, to the class website sometime like after I do this. <laughs> um, and uh, basically that will give you kind of like a head-to-head -head comparison on what they look like and how they're different. Um, they are different. The major difference is that the legacy Rhino renderer is really in most cases the renderer that I recommend that you use for this class. Why? because it finishes in less than 24 hours uh, chunking along on your laptop. <laughs> um, the Rhino renderer is like a high-end, what's called a ray tracing renderer that is really good for glass and reflections and kind of fancy stuff. But if you have a sort of like more basic kind of render, um, you're not going to see the difference. And it takes about between 10 to 100 times as long. Um, to render. So, so it's like um, if I get an email from a student that says my render has been working for you know, more than two days, um, pretty much my universal answer is um, try restarting your computer. <laughs> like something has gone terribly wrong. Um, render, for the render at the size that you're making for this class, you should not spend more than half an hour making a render. If you're spending more than a half an hour, email me, and I will help you optimize it so that you don't have to waste that time. Um, so I'm just telling you this now. <laughs> OK? Um, so if, if it goes into the like one to two hour range, just, I mean, if, you're, if it's not the day before the assignment is due, feel free to email me <laughs> and let me know, you know how I can help. Um, I'll help you kind of scale it down and, and think about ways that you could make it a little more efficient. So, so I'm going to switch to this legacy Rhino render um, because, uh, like you, I don't have all day to render this. And then if I go to render properties, 
Do, do. So there's a lot of uh, important stuff in here, and I'm going to try to just um, leave my uh, leave this up for a couple seconds so that you can see my settings. Um, for this class, I am asking you. Let me double check and just make absolutely 100% sure. Do, 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 do. Right. So um, the requirement that we're looking for is uh, 1920 pixels. So that means that it has to be at least 1920 pixels in one direction. So um, it happens that there's a preset 1920 by 1080, um, which will get you there. For quality, I think right now I'm going to select good quality. Um, my recommendation for your final render is that it be good or final quality. Um, if you are rendering to sort of test out colors or how things appear, you would certainly want to put it on draft because it works like, like way faster. Um, and it gives you enough information to kind of make decisions. So other things that you want to make sure that are sort of turned off, if you're using lights, you want to turn the skylight off. And then aside from that, um, the other settings are things that you don't really have to worry about. So I'm going to go ahead and close this, and we can make at least one render before we have to head out today. OK, classic. Classic blunder. So you may be looking at this and saying, hmm, that's lovely, but it's not what we wanted. Right. So, <laughs> so Rhino um, will only render the view that you have active. So if you have um, this view active, um, that should now render this view. Oh, that's annoying. Um, let me just jump into my settings for a second. Oh, I see what's happening. Okay, actually, everything's fine. <laughs> it was a Zoom issue. <laughs> oh, man. So, I mean, you can see just like, even with just a little bit of the render done, like how drastically different it looks from the sort of viewport. Um, and that's just because the viewport has to sort of provide information to you like at the second that you ask for it, right? Where this render can take, you know, three or four minutes to chunk through the same image. So things are looking pretty lovely. Um, so we're going to spend some more time sort of thinking about rendering, and we're also going to spend some more time thinking about materials. Um, I would challenge uh, sort of all of you to um, email me um, if you have any sort of questions about topics that we haven't covered that you want me to talk to you about regarding Rhino. Um, there's like a ton more to talk about. So if there's anything that you're curious about um, and you want me to cover during the, our sort of flexible day, um, feel free to send me an email. And if it's, you know, like, maybe if it's like, how, do I, how would I model a cat in Rhino? Probably my answer would be, I would not. I would get a character modeler. But um, we could talk a little bit about organic form. Um, we could talk about other, other potential topics or issues. Um, that you might be interested in, so let me know. Um, does anyone have any questions before we break? All right, so this render, um, I'm gonna go ahead and save to sort of um, you know, upload to the website. I'll do a render with the other method, and you can look at them side by side. There will be some differences, but um, for the most part, I think you know, the legacy render is where I would invest my energy. All right. Have a good couple of days. We'll we'll finish all this stuff up on Thursday.